This is, um, I'm now going to talk about black-white IQ differences in the United States. Um, and by extrapolation, apply it to the rest of the world. But most of the research over the last hundred years, most of the big issues have concerned why do black people in America, on average, score 15 or more points lower than whites? Is it genetic? Is it environment? And this is a, a top journal. It's psychology, public policy, and law. It's a law journal, which means that all lawyers who deal with affirmative action kinds of programs read it. It's the only law journal published by the American Psychological Association. And I'm saying all this to try to give a sense of the importance and, and high top draw <coughs> quality of this particular journal. Um, the entire issue of June 2005 was dedicated to an article by Arthur Jensen and me, if we go to the next one, um, in which we reviewed 30 years of research on race differences ever since Jensen's um, major piece in, in 1969 that uh, really shook the world of, of the egalitarians and now it's come full circle. And basically what we said was we concluded that it was the difference between blacks and whites is 80% heritable. We started with a model that says it's 50% genetic, it's 50% environmental. We concluded with the view that it was 80% genetic. Uh, and we had very good evidence to go with that particular model. And I'm not going to go through all the technicalities, but what I am going to do is give you some sense of the flavor because there are 10 technical categories of evidence that we marshaled to show that well, this lines up this way, this lines up this way, this lines up this way, to show that it was genetic. There is, as far as we can see, no cultural comeback. Um, before I go through the 10 categories, I can tell you that the American Psychological Association took about two years or two and a half years to finally accept our paper and agree to publish it in this journal. But they would only publish it contingent upon finding uh, four commentators who would be able to comment and shoot down, presumably, our paper, although they would then give us the right of reply, they were very fair, and have the last word, and see if we could reply to whatever the criticisms were. Um, and so the cultural, culture only group came back and did their best, but uh, the, the, their best really wasn't good enough. And in fact, it would be a very, very hard thing to shoot it down. Here's the evidence. Let's go to the first slide. First category of evidence, the worldwide IQ distribution. You have to explain why white people in Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and Argentina and America and Canada and England and Scotland all have an IQ of 100, or France or Germany or Russia. Why doesn't it vary around? And furthermore, it stays that way for 100 years. And furthermore, it doesn't matter how you measure it. You can measure it by reaction time measures, culture fair tests, this test, that test, the other test. Over 100 years, it's consistent. Same with blacks, same with whites. Um, same with East Asians, I should say. Next slide. Race differences, that is the magnitude of the black-white difference, are most pronounced on the most G-loaded tests. G being the general factor of intelligence, which is the active ingredient in intelligence tests. It really is the predictive part of a test. And different items of an IQ test load differentially on it. And black-white differences load differentially on it. And the black-white differences load on it in exactly the same pattern as does the G differences. They're one and the same and you have to explain why that pattern occurs. Um, if culture was as important as people try to make out, blacks actually think differently than whites. Then this would show up as a pattern of differences in the way they respond to items. But there are no race-specific cultural effects. There are only these G-factor differences. Bit technical, but in any case, it's a problem to explain if you're trying to explain it away. Go to the next slide. Race differences, black-white differences, are greatest on the most heritable items. So if you give 
an IQ test to a pair of twin, to twins and you calculate the heritabilities of those items and then you take those item heritabilities and you look at black-white differences on those same item heritabilities. The black-white differences mirror the same pattern of heritabilities that you've picked from the twin study. Now, blacks and whites differ most on the most genetic traits, implying that the differences between the blacks and whites are genetic. <coughs> Next slide. Brain size differences. Uh, there are several ways of measuring brains, uh, and they've been measured for 200 years. I mean, you can take a wet brain out of a skull, put it in a pan, weigh it, it weighs about three pounds. Uh, that's an autopsy measure. Or you can find an empty skull somewhere and fill it up with lead shot, pour that into a graduated container and see how much filler there is in the graduated container. That's another way of measuring skull size, brain size. You can take a tape measure and put it around somebody's head and measure the size of the skull. Crude, but it works. You can take calipers and measure the length, width, and height, multiply these into a volume measure. And today, you can even use magnetic resonance imaging and take a picture of the brain inside the skull while the person's alive, sitting there answering IQ tests. All these four ways converge on almost exactly the same results. It's a hundred grams of difference between blacks and whites, um, and about a 17 grams of difference between East Asians, uh, I mean, cubic centimeters, I'm sorry, 100 cubic centimeters of difference, five cubic inches uh, difference between blacks and whites. That's a lot of brain tissue, about one cubic inch between East Asians and whites. And yes, even within whites, the bigger your brain, the higher your IQ score. Uh, it's not a huge correlation, but it's there. So, people have to, culture only people have to explain why do blacks have smaller brains. Evolution explains it, but culture only theory doesn't really. Next one studies of racial admixture. If you look at blacks and whites, you can look at the color of the skin. The lighter the color of the skin, the higher the IQ of the black, uh, or some other measure of genetic admixture. And in South Africa, Cape Coloreds have an IQ score into between the white populations and the black populations from which they come. Next study. Transracial adoption studies. Take black children, or you take mixed race black children, you take Chinese children, and you let them be adopted by people in Belgium, nice middle class people in Belgium, or in uh, America and you let them grow up in these nice upper middle class white families. How do they grow up? Do they, do they, are their IQ scores like nice upper middle class white people? The answer is no. Uh, they are like the racial category from which they come on average. The black black children have an IQ of 84, 86, maybe 90. The black white children have an IQ of 95. Um, the East Asian children Chinese children have an IQ higher than the white children among whom they were raised. Uh, so the racial pattern is consistent. Next one. Regression to the mean effects. This again is technical, uh, but one example, which is a, a sad example really, uh, if you have uh, a pair of uh, highly intelligent black couple, they marry, uh, they have good paying jobs, a couple of hundred thousand dollars between them, they go and they live in an 